Okay, happy Tuesday. Today we're talking about chapter 20 in our Deuteronomy study, which is a chapter that will probably make you a little squeamish because it talks about warfare. This is a reality that no matter how much we watch on TV or how much we digest the news, we, unless you're a veteran, we have no idea what warfare is really like. But in God's methodology, there is something very clear about warfare that I think we ought to pay attention to. So in chapter 20, it starts off and there are two things that I want to call out. The first thing is it says, when you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots. That doesn't sound all that exciting to us, but this represents like the worst of the worst. Think of like the nuclear weapon of the ancient age, horses and chariots. For an army to have both of those things meant that they were among the most powerful army in the ancient world. It would be enough to strike fear into your very heart. And this is not something that the Israelites, especially the second generation, wouldn't be familiar with. After all, when their parents escaped from Egypt, Pharaoh chased them famously with horses and chariots. And do you remember what happened in that story? Look at the end of this uh, section in verse 4. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. This is one of the most important lessons I think that we ought to take from this chapter of Deuteronomy. It doesn't matter what you're facing, horses, chariots, or whatever the modern equivalent is for us in today. God is the one who fights our battles. God is the one who makes us victorious. It's, there's nothing we can actually do ourselves. In the Exodus story in chapter 15, we get the famous poem about horse and rider he threw into the sea, hurled into the sea. You get the picture of the waves coming and swallowing up this mighty army that Pharaoh has amassed. And God is telling the children of that generation, Remember, I took care of it back then. I can take care of it again now. I'm the one who's going to give you the victory. And as if that's not enough of a, a motivating image, he's then going to tell them through Moses what to do to make that image even starker. So he gives four instances, Moses does, of people who he's going to like disqualify from service in the army. Now, I am no military strategist, but I know that numbers are pretty important. It's part of like every movie about war or battles that I've seen from Lord of the Rings to you name it. Numbers matter to the point where you're willing to make anyone fight for you, even if they haven't ever fought before, because numbers are so important, but not in God's army. He says, any man who's built a new house but hasn't lived in it, you can leave. Anyone who's planted a vineyard but haven't enjoyed its fruit, by the way, a process that would have taken like three to six years, you're free to leave too. Any man who has been engaged but not yet gotten to enjoy their spouse, yeah, you can go. Oh, and by the way, if you're just afraid, you can leave too. God sends all of these people home. <clears throat> He disqualifies them from serving in the army and gives them a free way out. It's like the anti-strategy. If the goal is to have numbers, what God does is shrink his numbers very strategically because these are things that would have been associated with enjoying life in the promised land. For whatever reason, these are people who have yet to really taste the fruit of what the promised land has to offer. A house, um, being able to eat off the land, enjoying a spouse, starting a family, or not trusting in God, just being afraid. God wants them to experience these things. And that, enjoying the promised land, in God's view, is way more important than fighting in a war. So what does this mean for us? I think this is showing that God doesn't need armies again to fight his battle. He just needs faithful people. Our job is not to fight for God or to fight our own battles. Our God is simply to be faithful. We just got back uh, a week ago from the Voyages of Paul trip. And one of the things Matt talked about over and over on that trip is what can God do with one faithful person? And I think this passage echoes that. What does God want to do through your life with just your faithfulness? 
God doesn't need you to fight his battles. He's got it well in hand, but he does want you to be faithful. So faithfulness is the first thing. And then at the end of this chapter, there's this seemingly random throwaway paragraph about trees. It starts with when in verse 19, when you besiege a city for a long time, making war against it in order to take it, you shall not destroy its trees. Okay, this is one of those sections that's really easy to go, that's weird, and just keep moving on. But you may remember a couple years ago in our Advent devotional when we talked about this, there's a really strange but beautiful connection in the Bible between humans and trees. More than any other living thing, trees are talked about in the Bible as opposed to humans and God. Trees are like number three. And often in the biblical story, humans are compared to trees or trees are used as a way of talking about people. So if you reread that section with this in mind, it's easy to see what Moses is alluding to. He's comparing two different kinds of trees, fruitful trees, trees that you can eat from. <clears throat> These are the ones that you can't destroy. But then there are trees that you can actually cut down. Which ones are those? Only the trees that you know are not good for food. So right away, again, we have two different kinds of trees, AKA two different kinds of humans, those that produce good fruit and those that are barren, who produce no fruit. And if you look at it through that lens, don't you see what he's talking about here? This is a metaphoric way of talking about humans in general, those that produce good fruit and can be allowed to live and stay and enjoy the land, and those that don't, aka all the cities that they're going up um, in warfare against, the ones that are producing bad fruit, the ones that are leading God or people astray from the worship of the one true God, who are practicing abominable practices like child sacrifice, they're bad fruit, they've got to be cut down. But the trees that produce good fruit, those can stand. This is what God wants for us too. Fruitfulness does not determine whether we live or die. It's not a matter of salvation, but it is a marker of what's inside of us. It's what we're talking about all year long with Cultivate. God desires for us these two things modeled in this chapter. First, faithfulness. It's one of the key themes of Deuteronomy. God wants people who are faithful to him, who put him above all things. And God also wants that faithfulness to transform us into the kind of people who produce good fruit. So here's the question for you. In all the different ways that you can metaphorically go to war today, all the different battles that you're facing, what does it look like to fight them with faithfulness and fruitfulness? We'll see you back here tomorrow.